Hello, my name is Tawny Smith, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. I'm excited to share this Sunday's message with you. Would you take a moment right now to subscribe to our channel? And if you like the video, be sure to give us a thumbs up so that we know you've been blessed. You can do those things below. We may not be just quite aware of how dependent we are on recipes. true though, right? It's true. Everything has a recipe. Everything has something. If you combine foods, if you add seasonings, if you either cook something or bake something, or even if you simply put something in the freezer to freeze it, you are working off of a recipe. Ice has a recipe, okay? You take water, you put it in an appropriate container, and you put it in the freezer. That is what you know as a recipe. And that's one I can actually do pretty well. Just saying. Boiling is a little different. Are you supposed to add salt or are you not supposed to add salt? Yeah, anyway. The thing I've noticed is that when you get into some of the actual recipes that have like multiple steps and ingredients, that you can give like five people the exact same recipe, and while they'll have something that has the same ingredients and basically the same idea, and and maybe even tastes similarly, but actually isn't quite the same thing. You know people like this, right? People that, you know, you hand them a recipe and it comes out looking like the picture, And I've noticed that lately, some of the things that I'm seeing, like as I'm scrolling through Facebook, it is never simply, make this delicious food. You're going to love it. It's always like, hey, check out these wonderful treats and, and how wonderful you can make them. And so anyway, um, these next few pictures are not for the faint of heart. <laughs> It's a Cookie Monster Cupcake. Isn't that just like... You're getting hungry now, right? Like, we should have had cookies. Well, this is how someone's came out. These are those melted snowman cookies supposed to look like the snowman just sort of melted and fortunately it was right there on a cookie so you can eat it up and, and those look really cute and wonderful. And this is someone else's version. <laughs> Not sure why the one had a bikini but it's all right. <laughs> Check out these cute strawberries. A couple of my kids saw this picture and they said, those strawberries look really good. Yeah, I wonder about these. <laughs> I added this one in there because I didn't even know there was such a thing. That is a meatloaf train. <laughs> a meatloaf train. If some of us made it, this is what it would look like. <laughs> I guess it's still a train. Looks like it's on the track, but it's perfect for Halloween because it's haunted. I thought this was just a really cool, cool cake and, and uh, Sour Patch Kids and got at least one kid that really likes that and I, you know I, I thought that might be one cake he actually likes but this is probably how it would turn out if we made it <laughs> recipe right yes. all about a recipe a recipe isn't an assurance for success and here's the thing, because we have recipes for food, right? But we also have recipes for life. Certain things we think we need to do or certain things that we think if we do a certain way, will come out a certain way. 
Just having a recipe or a formula doesn't mean that things are going to be constant or consistent, right? Because I think that those people either came off the same recipe or, or the person making the train probably had the picture of the meatloaf train in front of them. But their result doesn't look anywhere near it. But they had a formula or a recipe to follow. And so I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about how that's not always the same. And as we've been talking about how God sort of aims to to shape us and to to reform us back into the image that he wants us to be in, is there a recipe to that? Are we finding ourselves in the midst of recipes? Are we finding ourselves trying to do things a certain way all the time and and I'm convinced I don't think God is using recipes or formulas in fact when I look around what I see is sometimes God surprises us he does something that we never expected and it comes out of left field right so I'm not sure how much we can say that My, my question for us then is this what is the recipe of faith that Jesus presents to his disciples because there's a few passages where, oh, where he talks about faith, but the one we're going to talk about today, and, and for many of you it's going to be quite familiar. But what is this recipe? What is it talking about? What, is it, what, what are we really supposed to get about this? What, what, if you were going to make faith, what recipe does Jesus want you to use? Here we go. It's going to be out of Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 14. We're going to go through verse 20. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private, and they said, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, if you're actually reading out of a paper Bible, you may notice that this particular story, in some versions, has an additional verse. If you have the NIV or a lot of other ones, you'd look through that and you would see, well, you probably wouldn't even notice, but it goes directly from verse 20 to 22. But the extra verse is from a different part of this story that you would be familiar with in Mark, where it says, this type only comes out in prayer. Okay? I want you to kind of put a little sort of thinking about that, all right? The first part of this passage is like most healing narratives. Now, we've been going through a lot of healing narratives over the last few weeks, and healing narratives kind of all have the same sort of look, the same sort of feel, the same sort of kind of what's going on, what's happening. And so you begin with a request, right? In this particular case, the request is coming from the father of the child, and it's really a a serious issue, right? It's, It's important enough that he's seeking out help. He's already gone to try to get help from the disciples, and now he's coming to Jesus directly. Matthew describes this ailment as literally moonstruck. Now, I don't know if you know what moonstruck means. I had to look it up myself because that really isn't a term that I'm familiar with. But essentially, he, he, he was acting like a lunatic. Moonstruck, lunatic, lunacy, all right? So that means that there's something going on. And in and, and today's language, most scholars think, well, this is probably the way they looked at things like epilepsy. So you go into seizures and and it's just, you know, not in in the right mind. So you've got this serious safety issue here. You you have a son who's moonstruck or who has epilepsy or is having seizures. And every time he gets near the fire, he ends up in the fire. Every time he, he gets in near the water, he ends up in the water, probably not able to swim, right? And so in this same story in Mark, Mark actually says that the demon's trying to kill the boy. 
that he keeps throwing him like, like the demon, like, oh, just kind of throwing the boy, trying to get rid of the boy. Unlike most healing stories, this one has Jesus' disciples out there trying to get the job done and failing. They tried and failed to heal this young child. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that and I'm like, yep, probably what would happen if we tried it, right? <laughs> Let me go get the boss. He's the one who knows how to do this. Right. Here's the thing. Chapter 10, Jesus sent out the 12. He says, listen, I'm giving you all the power all the authority, you can go out and do all of these healings. And essentially what he's doing is he's trying to get them ready for the, the moment when he's not going to be there. So it's sort of a practice run. He sends them out. He says, go heal some people, right? Go get the job done. And, and so they do. And so they were out doing all of this. In the meantime, there's a little part of this that I haven't told you yet. And that is that when we got to the beginning of this passage, Jesus and three of the disciples had been up the mountain and it's what we know as the transfiguration. I'm not going to bore you with all the details on that. I know you guys are wanting to say lots of amens so that the flight lands sooner. <laughs> but... So there were nine of them out there doing the same sorts of things and apparently having a little problem with it. And maybe because Jesus was sort of away for a little bit. He left the building and, you know, now do we do? But what I want you to, to catch here is that the disciples had already been doing this very same thing in other circumstances. This isn't the first time. It's not like they, th they thought, well, you know, we've seen Jesus do this. We'll do it. Give it a try. See what happens. Right? They'd been successful. You don't sound very convinced. Unlike most healing narratives, Jesus refers to the faith of the community in this story, not the faith of the individual. The father comes up and he says, look, I need you to heal my son. Your disciples tried and they need some training, Jesus. Could you, could you work on that? Jesus doesn't say, you know, the problem is that you don't believe the way you ought to believe. In fact, the implication is really that he has the belief because he's the one there in front of Jesus asking for healing. And Jesus expands it to this big thing. You, you unbelieving generation. Now that's pretty bad enough, but he calls them depraved too. Unbelieving and depraved. Well, just how long am I going to have to deal with you? No, I've never felt like that about any of you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> When you think about this, is the unbelieving and perverse generation about the man? Probably not. Sure doesn't seem like it. Is it about the disciples? Because you can almost read that into it, right? How long are you disciples not going to figure this out? I've given you all the power you need. You've been out doing it. I walk up the mountain to get transfigured and get ready for my ultimate departure. And here y'all are, and you can't even keep things going while I'm at lunch, right? I, I could see where you could read that, but I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. I'm just not convinced that that's what it is. In fact, I, I really think that he's aiming it at the whole crowd. It says that there was a crowd, and this man came and knelt in front of Jesus. That's sort of a sign of belief, right? A sign of respect. Hey, you've got the disciples who are trying to do the right thing, but for whatever reason, this didn't work out. And then you have the crowd, who maybe is there to see, well, let's see what happens. This could be fun. That Jesus guy's been going from place to place. And sometimes some pretty cool things, you know, we might even get free lunch. You've heard of the feeding of the... Just making sure. Jesus does seem a little bit frustrated with the fact that there seems to be some unbelief when he's not physically there. 
And if you know that you're about to leave and that you're no longer going to be walking on this earth and, and that you need your disciples and, and then ultimately more and more and more believers to carry it on, you might be a little frustrated on the day that you realize that they're still not quite getting it. So Jesus says, bring the boy to me. And, and, and I, I chose the word demands for the slide quite specifically because I get the impression that Jesus is a little frustrated at this point. I know we always want to talk about Jesus. Oh, he was always just so nice. But I don't think he went, you are an unbelieving and perverse generation. How long must I continue to bear with you? Why don't you go get the boy and bring him here? No, I have a feeling he was kind of sour. You unbelieving generation! How long are you going to... Will you ever figure this out? Come on, it's right in front of you. Get the boy and bring him here. Like most of the healing stories, Jesus heals with words. Really quite complicated series of words, actually. You caught that? Jesus said this particular incantation and it was over. You saw that? No, because we don't even know what he said. He rebukes him. I'm not exactly sure how that looked. I'm not even sure we should go where my imagination would take me. But what we do know is that the, the healing happens now, in this moment, without any delay. Amen. And from that moment on, that boy is healed. No more epilepsy or lunacy or seizures. No more concerns that he's going to end up in the fire or in the water and there won't be somebody standing right there to protect him. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't still have some scars. Maybe from falling into a fire, there's a burn. Or, or maybe from falling somewhere else, there's a scratch that's never going to fully heal. But at that moment, the demon is gone. It's done. You guys aren't nearly as excited as this ought to be. Second part of this passage is a conversation. You begin with a traditional sort of healing story with a few things that are not quite the same, but, but with the, the, the idea that someone asks for healing, there's a request, and, and the man even saying, hey, have mercy on me, or have mercy on my son. And Jesus bringing the boy to him and then just taking care of it. The second part of this story, though, is, is a little bit more uncomfortable, right? The second part of this is when the disciples pull Jesus aside and go, Hey, um, Jesus, we thought we said all the right words. We did the abracadabras and we did the, oh, please, God, and, and all of those sorts of things, but what happened? What happened? Ever been there? Have you ever like been faced with a temptation or something and, and you do everything that your recipe book tells you to? And then you kind of go back to Jesus and say, hey, I did what I thought I was supposed to do, but guess what happened? Hmm. Few of you are admitting that. The disciples have a question. It's a simple question. It's a what happened question. It's a how did this happen? What did we do wrong? What, what sorts of things could we do different next time? Because, you know, we got to get this recipe right. If you're leaving soon, we got to know what to do because, you know, we don't have the master baker, the master chef, the, the whatever. We're going to have issues. The focus would have almost certainly been on technique. It's how we think, by the way. when we want to do something, and it's particularly a skill. Now, I don't know if we would call healing a skill normally, but a skill, we concentrate on technique. 
we do what they did back in the Bible days. We go over to YouTube and we start looking up videos on what the skills are. A couple of times, I, I've wanted to know if I could do something. And I, I go to YouTube and I, you know, could I change this part on my dryer or something? And I watch the YouTube video and the, and the end result is usually the same. Repairman. <laughs> But, you know, we look at the techniques, and, and so if you want to do something better, we would find techniques. Go take a class. Go do whatever, right? And so this is sort of what they're doing. They've, they pulled Jesus aside, and they said, show us the YouTube video that'll, that'll do the right thing, or tell us in, in class what we need to know. And that's what they focused on. Hey, essentially, our formula is not working. What's yours? How are you able to do it? Because after all, I don't know how hard they tried, but I'm guessing they tried pretty hard, and the kid is still not healed. And then they bring him to Jesus, and Jesus is like, oh, demon, you're rebuked, and the kid's all better. You've been there. I know you've been there. Where you've tried to fix something, or you've tried to open a jar or something, and then somebody else comes up and goes, what was the problem? copy machine won't work the copier guy will walk in and he'll go it's working for me well could you sit there for a few days hmm. Jesus rebukes again he rebukes the first time a demon this time I, I really feel like he sort of rebukes the disciples right so the first time the demon is told hey Get out of there. You don't belong in that little boy. Leave him alone. And, and the demon goes. The second time, he, he says, hey, you disciples, here's you. The reason you couldn't do it is because you had so little faith. Well, thanks. Right? Ever feel that way? You ever ask for Jesus something, he didn't give it to you, and, and somebody says, well, you'll just have to keep believing. started to wonder about this. What would have diminished their faith? Uh, assuming that when Jesus sent them all out, all 12 are out healing and stuff, and they saw success, how come now they don't have enough faith, even though they had enough back in chapter 10? What is it in the pages between 10 and 17 that suddenly they need more power, a little more pixie dust or whatever? Right? I wonder about this. I started to think about us. And sometimes we go to God, and, and sometimes we go to God knowing that everything is going to be A-OK. -okay. Right? It's easy. I think that's true. But then I wonder if this boy had some pretty severe symptoms, unlike any other they had seen. So that when God throws something at us that we haven't seen before, that maybe we start to go, well, you know, I know that God has taken care of me thus far quite well, uh, but I'm not sure necessarily that he's going to be able to handle this if I just simply pray about it. Or if I simply tell him, or, or if I just simply rebuke the demon. Perhaps without everyone, since some of them had gone up to the mountain with Jesus, their confidence was sort of waning. Now think about it. Jesus is going up. He's going to be transfigured. He's going to be prepared for, for what's about to happen to him. He only takes three guys with him. The three guys that you see mentioned over and over again in Scripture, right? So we know the nine stayed behind, and we know their names, but we don't usually talk about them. But you've got your three that have gone up, and so like all the, say, the superstars, right? You know, in every group of 12, there's got to be at least three or four that they're, you know, type A personality going to go. We're going to get it done. We're going to go with Jesus up the mountain, and then that leaves all the rest that are maybe a little more like me that are not so confident all the time. Oh, yes, well, if only Peter was here, or James or John... They would know what to do. 
I wonder if that's what they did. Jesus seems to be saying that they have some faith rather than none. He, he says it's because your faith is so low, which, which describes a situation where there's at least a little bit of faith, right? That's how I read that. He doesn't say, well, if you'd only believe in me, if you'd only believe in God, well, you'd have this thing down. Wouldn't that be cool? He didn't say that. I think he knows where their belief is. I, I think he knows they have some faith. He, he may then, if he's saying you have no belief, have been calling them the unbelieving generation from previous. I don't know that I, I still don't think that I think that that's what he's saying. But they have so little faith now. What is up with that? How is it possible that they had lots of faith, they were healing people, they were doing all these other things, and now Jesus is saying, you, you could have done it, your faith was too low. That's what you want to hear from Jesus too, right? You could have been the one to be God's instrument to heal that boy, but you don't have any faith. The second thing Jesus says is that very little faith is required. So you must have some faith, which would mean very little faith, but very little faith can move mountains. Anybody else confused? Could you come up here and take over? Because I'm like... <laughs> faith the size of a mustard seed moves mountains. Faith the size of a mustard seed moves mountains. M mustard seed is about a millimeter round. For those of you that n need the visual, that's a tenth of a centimeter. Since we work off centimeters, right? All right, well, how about this? There are 25.4 milli millimeters in one inch. So in about that amount of space, if you line them end to end, you could probably get 25 mustard seeds. And I might be exaggerating my inch. It was this big. <laughs> doesn't seem like much faith at all, right? Because if it's the size of a mustard seed, and, and I, you know, kind of will go back to my imagination, because it's the only thing I have to work with, and you've been warned. But imagine all of this being unbelief. That my body is unbelief, and what Jesus says is you need to have enough belief in you that matches one mustard seed. In other words, like one little speck in my fingerprint worth of faith. That doesn't seem like a lot of faith to me. Now, if you've got to get this thing half full or three quarters before you can start healing people, well, now that's a whole other different story. But the, what did Jesus say? He said with one tiny little mustard seed, you could move a mountain. Seems to me like Jesus is saying, if you have any faith, it's enough. It doesn't matter if you have some doubts to go with your faith. It doesn't matter if you've had faith for a hundred years or you've had faith for five minutes. Any faith and you have the power. That's exciting. Some of you aren't quite as excited, but anyway... If very little faith is required, and theirs is so little, they haven't even reached mustard seed size yet, I don't think there's hope for any of us. What is Jesus talking about? You have some faith, but you need to have at least a mustard seed size worth. Anybody else still confused? thought about this. What is required for faith to move mountains? Here's the recipe. Are you ready? I put it in the notes so you can write it down. It'd make it really easy. You know, kind of. In this context, nothing seems to be about signs of the kingdom. I realize it's kind of awkwardly worded, so let me make sure that I explain this to you. 
What Jesus is talking about is that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can go out and show others that you belong to the kingdom of God as much as you belong to this world. So if you want to have enough faith to move a mountain, the first thing you have to understand is that you are a member of the kingdom and your job as part of what you're doing as a Christ follower is to make sure that you are performing these signs. Fair enough? Yes. Fair enough. This is what Jesus essentially was doing back in chapter 10 when he told his disciples, you have all the power and authority that I have. Go out and use it. Woohoo! First time my dad handed me his car keys, he was giving me all the power and authority that he had to drive. And a full gas tank. Right? That's what Jesus was doing. And now he's saying, if you have just even a tiny little bit of faith, guess what you can do? That's really cool, you guys. You should be excited. Second, I think that it seems to, to be that the faith of whoever's going to receive the sign is also a factor in this. Because it seems like Jesus doesn't go around healing people that don't want to be healed because they might be healed by God. You kind of notice that? In fact, nine out of ten times, what does Jesus say? Your faith has healed you. He doesn't say, well, I, I know you don't believe in God and you don't believe in me, but I had a little extra power, so hope you enjoy it. In the, this particular story that we were looking at this morning, again, the, the faith of the Father seems to be rather evident. He went to the disciples. He comes and he kneels at Jesus' feet and says, will you help? Here's what's going on. Your disciples couldn't get it done. Hmm. Third, well, we probably don't even have to say this. The will of God is the most important thing in a healing. Amen. Otherwise, some of us would realize that we could use a little more money and we would say we have the faith of a mustard seed and therefore, we should go buy our mega millions or whatever lottery ticket. <laughs> and because we've prayed for it, we should get the two billion or whatever the amount is. It's not the message that Jesus is giving here. It's about signs of the kingdom. It's about what God's will is to do. And ultimately, sometimes we think God ought to do something. Hey, and we've all been there. I know we all have. We think God ought to handle something a certain way or ought to do something for somebody or, or heal somebody. And God goes, mm, no, sorry. We don't know why God wills things to be a certain way at certain times. We just know that he does. What is the recipe of faith that Jesus presents his disciples? What is it? Here's a couple of ideas for you. First, is that faith that moves mountains is not a possession to be owned. I think one of the problems that we face is when we talk about faith, we think of it as though it is a possession that we own, like a, like a closet full of clothes. That if we can just get enough faith in our closet and we can just keep putting it on when we need it. That it becomes a possession that we are owners of instead of what it really is, which is a belief. You don't necessarily own faith. Think about that for a minute. You can own a recipe. You can share it and you can do all of that and you can share faith. But, but it's not like, you know, hey... Check out my recipe book. That's one thing. Hey, check out my faith. People either see it in you or they don't. The ability to show others the signs of the kingdom isn't a magic trick that we can perfect. Because otherwise the recipe would be you need to believe and here's what you say. I love that he doesn't even bother to tell us what Jesus said. He rebuked the demon. Because if it said he rebuked the demon by saying, hey, yo, get out of there. 
then we would just automatically assume that's what you have to say to all demons. Right? So, you know, <clears throat> believing that, but anyway. When it comes to faith, there are no recipe steps to follow. How do you get more faith? Yeah. I wish I could give you three simple ways, right? Well, I can give you two, but the third one's a mystery. The first one is come to church. The second one is give lots of money. Some of you are ready to write that down. <laughs> There's no steps to follow for more faith. Guess what? Do you want to know how you get more faith? You love Jesus more. Amen. How do you get more faith? Well, you walk with Jesus a little further. Amen. Hmm. Do you want to, this is, this, I think this is kind of cool, right? This is a challenge for you this week. Pray about something you think God doesn't care about. Or that you don't think God can handle. And see what he does. And guess what will happen? You may end up with a little more faith at the end. And you didn't have to come to church? Well, you did, but you... I mean, you're here now. And you didn't have to give a lot of money away. <laughs> did you notice... Again, that there is no formula. It'd be so easy. We'd go around healing people all day long, right? Oh, you're sick? No problem. If I say these magic words, you'll be better. Hmm, no. It's not a routine. When we're done, cha-ching, blessing, whatever that blessing may be. The problem is that ultimately the authority and the power doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And so if the authority and the power belongs to God, then as we begin to work, as we begin to walk with God, as we begin to have the faith that God is calling us to have, it's not our power that makes it happen. We use it, but God is the one who does the work. If you're all tired out because you're going around trying to have more faith, you're doing it wrong. Doing it wrong. You see, the recipe is to have a small faith in a great God. So now I talk to you about how I would think that a mustard seed would take up a you know, little tiny mark on my hand and, and that's all that Jesus said is needed. Well, think about a great God who created this world. He must be much bigger than me. I'm starting to wonder if I could handle more faith than the faith of a mustard seed because I'd be so powerful when I have God on my side. You're supposed to get excited about that. Because if it's true for me, it's true for you, right? Amen. You see, I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples is, here's the problem. You took a look at this boy, and you said, this one's going to be hard. Because you thought you were the one that had to do the work. You see, it's not about moving literal mountains. It, we'd have a huge mess if we did that. <laughs> a huge mess. I don't like that mountain. Well, I liked it. I don't like it over there. I want to put it over there. No, I liked it where it was. We can't agree on the color of the carpet. You want us to agree on where to leave a mountain? <laughs> Just saying. Do you see all the mountains that move around you? 
I mean, come on now. If you are somebody who's been paying any attention to the world around you and you believe in Jesus Christ, you can look on any given day and see God doing things all around you in ways that you would have never imagined in some ways that he gives you a miracle before you even know to ask for it. Great big mountains being moved and picked up and taken out of your way. And God says, you need to have this incredible amount of faith. It, it, it's got to be deep within you. It's got to be so much faith that you can hardly even imagine living without it. Yes, the faith of a mustard seed. Right? See, it's not about a recipe. It's about how are we being shaped. My concern is that for a while, I think we've taken the Christian faith, we've taken Jesus, and we've taken him as a possession. Something that we, um, for lack of a better term, own. And Jesus tells us in this passage, it's not about owning me. It's about believing in me. And having the power that God wants you to have. So I think he's telling the disciples, hey, listen. The reason why sometimes we aren't getting what we want from God is because we don't really believe in him. We see him as a possession. Oh, I need a little God. Where did I put him? <laughs> Hope he's not down there because it's kind of messy down there. <laughs> did you see him over here? No. Uh, yeah, but you know, I really wanted that offering plate to be fuller. I got to go find him and get it fuller because he could touch it and double. Maybe the million dollar check is in there already. <laughs> not what Jesus is all about, y'all. It's not. You walk out that door, all you got to have is the faith of a mustard seed, and guess what? You have all the power of God. Amen. And you want to know the biggest miracle he wants to do? It's within you. He wants to change your eyes so that you see every blessing as he sees it. A gift from him. He wants to change your heart so that when you see somebody else, he even, even when they cut in front of you at the lunch line, <laughs> or take the last thing off the buffet or the potluck, <laughs> that you can go, oh, that's all right, it's all right. Because God loves us all the same. Not that anyone ever cuts you off in traffic, but if they ever did... be reshaped into somebody who isn't, you know, oh, I got to get some Jesus so I'm protected here, but to realize that Jesus was in that moment the whole time. Amen. Because of who he is and because of who we are and that faith walks around with us every day. Hey, if you ever want to totally annoy me, come to church on Sunday and act like a Christian. You're wasting your time because it's not a possession. Faith of a mustard seed is going to affect you when you walk out that door. It's going to be with you everything you're doing. I better be careful. I'm going to preach all morning. Amen. This is not about, you want me to preach longer? Okay, we'll go back. <laughs> it's not about what we do as much as who we believe. Right? Because all the things I've been talking about, I don't do. God does everything. Hmm. Do you have amazing faith? I think amazing faith could be defined in our terms as a, the kind of faith that isn't a possession. Instead, it's the kind of faith that is who you are. And that is somebody who loves Jesus so much 
that you couldn't imagine walking a day without him, even though some days you may only have a mustard seed's worth and other days you're just basking in the glory of who God is. Amazing faith is the best faith for us to have. If you don't have it, you want it. You need to get it before you leave. We got plenty of it here. Why? Because it's a little bit of belief in a really great God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. You haven't asked us to be a people who never doubt, a people who are able to, out of our own power, bring healing to others, a people who, out of our own power, are able to bring love to the entire world, people in our own power who can make great things happen. But Lord, we thank you that you are the powerful God who works through our everyday lives. Hmm. The God who's just the mustard seed full of faith can be taken anywhere we might go, even into the places where the world might say it's not welcome. Heavenly Father, as we leave this place this morning, if there's any here this morning who say, I'm not sure I have even a mustard seed of faith, that this would be the moment that you just empower them with the knowledge that if they have put their trust in you, that little bit of faith is more than enough. Forgive us of the times when we have said, Lord, would you do something amazing in our lives and bring healing? And then we've turned around and tried to do it ourselves. Keep us from doing that ever again. We love you. We thank you. Be with us as we leave this place this morning. Keep us safe throughout the week that we might worship together once again. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching this sermon with me. If you've enjoyed your time with us, we would invite you to join us in person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information.